The real world is built for neurotypical people. It's built for a very specific way of wiring of a human being. I have very rarely seen a young person who is really into video games or fantasy that is not at the same time either living under some sort of disabled label or not accepted or bullied or they're not accepted in real life, basically. A lot of people on the autism spectrum um, and the related ones like dyspraxia and dyslexia and stuff think visually or visually conceptually or artistically or something like that. They need a higher reasoning for something. They need more engagement on something. They need room for the incredible intellect that they have stored in their little flesh sack to go nuts. I enjoy making wooden swords. If we want to talk about feeling powerful, most of these kids are not physically active. You know, they don't do sports, they don't do soccer. But you put a sword in a kid's hand, and suddenly they feel powerful. I yeah, expected this to go horribly wrong. <laughs> it's ready to hand to a young boy. He's just started at Mockingbird, and I'm going to be one-on-one -on -one mentoring him as well. So this Thursday we'll start, and I'll teach him how to use this properly. It'll be good. Yeah, I'm 28, male. I'm originally from Canada. I'm married. I have two awesome children. How'd you sleep? Too bad. I was after him. Pretty good, actually. I love you. Big gamer, love fantasy and sci-fi. I do martial arts, I do medieval sword fighting, run my own business, so I'm an entrepreneur. Every meal you do this, don't you? I'm a mighty warrior here to shine light into darkness. When I was growing up, First, you know, my parents were extremely happy. Like, I was healthy, I was very intelligent. Schools where that sort of thing started to go downhill, I didn't really like paying attention much. I didn't sit still. You couldn't really tell me what to do or change the plan because I got upset when that happened. And certainly I can remember, you know, not fitting in or, or not getting along with people my age. So about seven years old, I sat in a room with a really nice lady and did like, you know, two or three hours worth of these tests and assessments. And that was it. Everything after that was different. They were told I was disabled, that I had an intellectual disability that affected concentration and focus. I was going to have nearly an endless supply of challenges as I grew up. I was diagnosed with ADD with ADHD traits. Your sister's running. She's circling us like a little shark. <laughs> what are you doing? Here's your mom. Cuddles. Wow, wow. I'll see you later. Boop. Bye. <laughs> Bye. See you later. In 2015, I first got into reenactment. Loved it from the first moment I did it. And it was like connecting to my history and being a part of something that's all this fantasy related stuff, but then it was physical. Bjorn is a, a persona that I've created of a 10th century Scandinavian warrior who, when he's not fighting, is a skald. And a skald is like a mixture of a storyteller and a historian and a entertainer. 
He would definitely be autistic if you were to assess and diagnose him. First time I met Jason, I was like, just like terrified because I was like, what is it going to be like? What is this going to happen? What if I say something wrong? What if he laughs at me? Well, you're going to try. Uh, no, it really started off like like mentor, kind of mentory, I guess. And then I think you just, you know, the more you're around someone, the more you get used to them and the more you open up to them. Ella is freaking awesome for a start. I have dyslexia, I have dyspraxia, I have mild Asperger's syndrome, I also have a little bit of OCD. Jason isn't just like a guy in a suit who's like, what's your problem? So he's like, so I've been here and this is what I did. Don't do that. It's a bad idea. Stop. Ready? Go. Go the horn! Woohoo! I was gonna say, why don't you keep moving? I'm like, just excited. Okay. <laughs> All right, ready? It's that whole thing with being able to escape what's going on and being a different person and not having to worry about whatever might be happening. It's that really self-confidence and self-empowering which kids like me have a really tricky time coping with because we're told we're useless or we're dumb. So it's that thing of being able to escape whatever is going on. As a seven-year-old, I felt horrible because every seven-year-old just wants to fit in. No joints, no neck, and don't stab. It's, it's something about our biology that we want to be part of the pack. We want to feel connected and, and valued as a community so that we can feel safe and then figure out who we are. And I never really got that chance. And from that moment forward, I was the ADD kid, or I was the disabled kid, or I was the misfit, or the outcast, or whatever. Yeah, it didn't, didn't feel great actually, and I did not like being on medication. And I spent a lot of nights crying myself to sleep trying to figure out what it was. And in the end, I just, I, the only conclusion I could reach was that inherently I was a horrible person and that I was being punished for just who I was. Strike six, flick. I was bullied basically every day of my life and often quite badly. Um, I can remember a particular six-month period where this one group of kids beat me up before school, all three breaks, so lunch and two other breaks, and if they could get me after school as well. Every day. I don't think a lot of people can understand what it is honestly like to go from the moment you wake up to the moment you grudgingly fall asleep utterly despising who you are, honestly thinking that you don't deserve to eat, or when people are bullying you, actually feeling a really weird sense of relief that someone else sees how horrible you really are and is doing something about it. And so I was sitting there thinking, what did I need when I was 14, when I was having all these troubles and struggling with depression and school and the expectation that I needed to pick a career path for the next 30 years and all that crap? And I was like, I needed someone who'd been through it, who could sit there and go, yeah, you're right, this sucks, but what are we going to do about it? Let's figure something out. So how you been? Um, good. Good? I had, like, friends and stuff, but instead of really hanging out with them at school and stuff, I just go to the library and read books all, all lunchtime and morning tea. I didn't really get that close to people. I just hang out with myself. So Felix is one of those young gentlemen who has allowed society to convince himself that he's no good. And at the age of 12 was just the most loving, biddable, compliant, geeky, academic kid you could imagine. And then puberty happened. <laughs> Grab one, two, three, four. Um, he became depressed and he wasn't doing his homework. He started having sort of shutdowns and meltdowns. Um, I had to face the fact that there was something big going on. So we self-referred to CAMS up at Tauranga Hospital and 
virtually in the waiting room, the, one of the nurses there came up to me and asked me if I'd ever heard of Asperger's. It doesn't change me as a person, like, I'm still the same, I'm still the same dude, like, but I just have another label. Um, he got to a very, very low point and um, was actually at risk. So um, we had to change everything that we were thinking and pulled him right out of school and he really needed time to recover from that. It's been three years. Has it? Yes. Um, or, I'm not orange. Inquisition came out 2014. Oh, wow. Thoughts changed from all these high hopes that I had for a really academic kid to actually just wanting one that was alive. I think you got smashed by that big guy. I did get smashed by that big guy. Imagine that hurt. Well, I'm dead now, so... The main thing, I think, for Felix to have Jason in his life is to yeah, have that friend and also that sense of tribe and belonging and for Felix not to be isolated is really important. Yeah. When I first met Jason, I was like like real down in the dumps like I was like in a really bad space mentally and I didn't really know what I was like doing with my life please get on the point get on the point Jason they're taking the point Jason they're taking the point all right Jason get all right gonna end this on a high when I first met him he wanted to die like the, what do you want to do Felix I want to die what are you gonna do tomorrow I'll probably be dead like really depressed really out of it like honestly could not See your future. It was real bad and like having someone to like kind of force me to like leave the house instead of just hang being depressed and miserable in my room all day. Um, it really helped a lot. Video games aren't real, but the feelings and emotions that we get from them are. The part I loved about video games and that really hooked me into them was they were all about some destined hero. They were important. They were the only person in the world that was important. And they had to save the world. And I couldn't do that in real life. You know, like I, I wasn't very good at soccer. I wasn't very physically fit or good at sports. I didn't get the highest grades in school. The teacher never, you know, singled me out because I was good. And that wears on a kid. But come home, take the backpack off, have a snack, say hello to my mum, watch Pokemon, go downstairs, power up the Sega Genesis, and suddenly I'm important. And can you blame me for wanting to get lost in this? And most kids, I think that's why they do it. And so with the video games, combating my depression and, and the anxiety and stuff with school, you know, I could go home and save lives. And saving their lives, digital though they may have been, fake though they may have been, it gave me a reason to live, weirdly. Sure. Because... Are you doing it? Like, that's your speech thing? Uh, it's the Networking for Inclusion seminar. Picture this, 18 years old, tiny little bit of stubble on the, on the upper lip, skinny as a bone, Weird hair, can't look you in the eye. Funny kid that in, into all sort of weird stuff. Definitely a virgin. So like, total weirdo. Like, let's be perfectly honest. So the, the opening bit, is it below the zip block? We kind of met each other and then I was on my OE and I went to England. And at the time it was MSN was the thing. So we talked on MSN um, while I was in England and then Kind of the relationship formed there, and then um, afterwards I got a working holiday visa in Canada and went to Canada. For some insane reason, or I thought it was an insane reason at the time, this girl actually liked me and wanted to hang out with me. Whatever. I wasn't going to argue at the time. I had a girlfriend. It was really cool. I ran out of money and I'm um, getting a bit homesick and I was like, I'm going to go home, do you want to come with me? And he's like, yeah, sure. That's old enough to leave house pretty much, isn't it? <laughs> well, that's not much. I was a mama's boy. I was uh, a wuss, really. But I said, sure, I'll come with you to this place I can't even find on a map. <laughs> I've never even heard before. Um, and yeah, and I got on the plane, moved here, and I've lived here ever since. I really enjoyed going to Mavora Lakes, actually. Mm. That was a highlight for me. That was our first wedding anniversary, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah. In 2014, I was working at a restaurant in Invercargill, 
We had like our busiest week of the year at the same time that the owner operator and the manager were away in Dunedin. And I snapped. I, I put way too much pressure on myself, way too much stress. And I screamed at one of the employees in front of some customers, went to the back, had a shouting match with her again, put my fist through the wall and broke down crying in the back. So that was fun. A little legal thing later, I had to seek counseling. Then we you know, did some sort of questionnaire or whatever. And I was leaning more towards Asperger's than, than um, ADD. I was doing my nursing training and I was doing mental health stuff and so I was learning a bit about diagnosing and stuff. And when he had a, his outbreak, we thought, oh, maybe it isn't ADD. And so Lisa and I started doing a lot of research and looking into what Asperger's was. And we started looking at the traits and it was like high anxiety, difficulty sleeping, mood swings, resistance to change and adjustment, you know, reliance on schedule. It was all these things and it was like, holy sh that's me. Like, if you're gonna put a glove on, that one's gonna fit perfectly. And we started to be able to actually reassess the entire way I was living and changing the way my life was structured day to day and week to week so that the negative stuff didn't pop up as much. And over the years since that's happened, I've been able to drop the negative stuff enough that all this other stuff is starting to come out. And that's the cool stuff. That's the magic. So I'm just separating out um, some wool to make it a bit thinner so it goes through the needle and threads easier. I'll use it to darn Jason's um, pants for his garb. One of the big misconceptions about autism is that autistic people are disconnected from their emotions or that they don't have them. Total bullshit. <laughs> Somebody on the autism spectrum, we feel emotional changes more keenly. So if you get happy, we get super ecstatic. If we're sad, or if you're sad, we're incredibly depressed. Like, it's this massive range of things. We're a lot more sensitive to it. When people say, you know, I'm surprised that an autistic person can fall in love, it's like, well, why? Did you not think we're human? It's layers. We feel love and compassion and kindness and sadness and anger and hatred. We're full human beings. If, if we want to talk about, you know, saving lives, video games preserved my life. It kept me alive long enough so that I could meet Lisa because she saved my life. It's, I guess, it's like the difference, again, with the, the medical view of putting somebody on life support and then actually curing whatever's wrong with them. She, she gave me a reason to live for so many years before I found one within me. Being a dad on the spectrum is interesting because like in, in normal life, you know, if the music's too loud, I can turn the music off, which happens a lot. Or if I'm getting overwhelmed by sensory input, I can go into another room. With a baby, you can't really do that. You kind of have to be watching them all the time or at least aware of them and, and know where they are and make sure that they're safe. I don't know what it is. Um, a counselor I was seeing when Taya was born suggested that because she's my offspring, that there's some sort of deep protective mechanism in my brain that counteracts the sensory overload and allows me to actually handle it. It's the same with, you know, the poop and, and the vomit and stuff. And I don't really do poop. I don't even like it when I poop, to be perfectly honest. But when it's your own kid, it's weird. You just find ways of managing it. Ready, set, go. And the best thing ever is when I come home from work at the end of the day and I open the door and Taya will just run across the lounge screaming because she's so happy to see me. And she just has to launch herself at me and give me a hug and there's, there's nothing better than that. Nothing at all. Hello, hello, okay. Go ahead. Woohoo! Woohoo! <laughs> right, you count dirty. Say one, two, three, go. One, two, go. Woo! <laughs> Creating a safe space for young people 
a space where they can be themselves, where they can get what they need as far as community goes. Morning, gentlemen. And then begin to build who they are, not who society says they are, not who their parents wish they were, which unfortunately comes up often enough, not what would be ideal in a perfect world without disabilities, but who they are. And that community is essential for that. So that's why Mockingbird works so well, is it's because it's a safe, non-judgmental environment for the kids to be in, where nobody's gonna make fun of them, nobody's gonna insult them, nobody's gonna, you know, hate them because they're the disabled kid. They can be them. The mask can come off and they can just be them. It's neurodiversity. It's beautiful. Have you finished the modeling course? That's why I'm making this for <laughs> Cool. Then I'm gonna do the animation bit and then I'm gonna put the animation onto this. I'm guessing you're gonna animate that cylinder rolling down the... Hopefully. Cool. And you didn't reckon that, that it would look it, good? Well, it depends on the size of it. I like mm. usually just do it way smaller because that's what I feel more comfortable with. Mm. He sees a future now. And maybe that doesn't sound big, but taking a, a kid from worse than what I was, and I was pretty bad, to, to even acknowledging one time out of five that his art is good and that he might actually be able to make a living selling it and that there is a future for him, that, like, that's all I can ever ask for from someone to make that shift. Most of the time when I actually draw something that I actually tried to draw, I don't really draw anything of a particular subject. I just draw whatever my fingers make and it just happens. Tell me about the troubles of being a young girl, because as you may have noticed, you know, I have never been a young girl. It's, the overstep of you. Yeah, don't really understand what that's like. <laughs> so I think I got my first cell phone when I was 16, so, and a lot of girls in my class weren't sure from that. They were purposely trying to put themselves out like that. No idea why, anyway. And I think that when you add in having all the dyslexia and the ADHD and dyspraxia and dyscalculia and... ADHD and all these things, it just kind of adds to the, just to the mountain. When I left college, I left because of bullying and I wasn't being supportive for my learning differences. And I was really, really sick. Like, I was off for like seven and a half months just not doing anything. She's another excellent example of why bullying and negative social interaction are really bad for people. She went through a number of schools when she was younger, being bullied and bullied again and further bullied often by the same girl. There was a lot of stuff going on that the school wasn't dealing with. Dimension where there's like another world yeah. above the world to, dis to destroy. Okay. We had to, to get to this yeah. fantasy heaven, we went through another fantasy heaven, which I managed to make some Elodrin mad. You, you upset yeah, that yeah. thing yeah. so fast. But, yeah, but I think this is why Felix um, isn't depressed, why he's so much happier and, yeah, it's been a really big deal. And not being pushed, not being forced into a, a place where he didn't belong and was really uncomfortable. You know, mainstream education and mainstream schooling just wasn't for him and if I'd kept pushing him, it, it would have been a pretty grim result. Yeah. Of that I'm really sure. Do you guys each want to say who your character is, introduce them, your ideal date, whether or not you like be walks on the beach or not? My character is Zilmon Beldeth. He is a half jaw rogue. He's 23 years old. His ideal date would probably be in like a nice, like like the sun setting. It's like in a nice cafe. Well, he introduced me to D and D, which is really cool, and it's like one of my favorite things, and it's really fun. Um, I kind of enjoy like that kind of fantasy stuff because I don't know, it like feels like another world, and especially with D and D, you can kind of just do whatever you want and be whoever you want to be, and just I don't know, not deal with pressures of modern society, and instead deal with orcs or whatever, or evil wizards, or vampires. Lots of vampires, too many vampires. As everybody knows, I shall be your dungeon master for the day, so I will control everything that isn't you, except for the land-based kraken, which, as we all know, belongs to Caesar. Roll it again, come on. Let's, Roll it again. Let's, let's see what you funny. would get as a different one. Let's make it go. Oh my god.
With Dungeons and Dragons, a lot of people will say, you know, games and stuff are a waste of time, but the kids that come to me often, they've been through counseling, they've been through CAMs or CIFs, who have all done their best, but they haven't really made much of a shift in the kids. They're not listening, they're not engaged. I've had a couple come to me that were suicidal. They're not taking us out of their own will. Like, if we kill the ants, so it will most likely stop. I was going to say, yeah, it would break them. Probably. First Dungeons & Dragons session we ever did, they couldn't look at each other, they couldn't look at me. Their heads were on the tables, they were mumbling, they were stupidly shy. And then now, <laughs> They're bubbly and happy, they're laughing and engaging, they're completely different children. And I can't take credit for all of that, I'll take some of the credit, but creating that safe space and bringing this game into their, their awareness and letting them play it their way has allowed them to connect to who they are and has allowed them to come out of those shells that they've built. And it's amazing. It's absolutely breathtaking. Okay. You rolled three d You rolled three net twenties today. Yes, and I chose it, which means so he can't not do anything find out. I don't know why. I knew that no. they would click, okay. and they did. They're just like mates. They'd hang out, and I love the rapid fire that goes on between them. They instantly know what the other one's thinking. They get each other, and that sense of community that I was talking about. What I really love is them joking about their own quirks. That's. Um, another 14. It's probably changed my life quite a bit, having someone to, like, talk to and stuff. He's basically um, being rebuilt. He's, you know, he's under construction. Yeah. So it's exciting to see, and we don't really know what he's going to turn out like. Yeah! <laughs> 42. So you shoot a lightning bolt out oh. of the Rod of Wonder. Oh, please no splash damage, please no splash damage, please no splash damage. Okay, the lightning bolt strikes the ant thing straight in the chest. Ooh, and uh, it explodes. Every one of them is brilliant. Every one of them is amazing, and every one of them, I look forward to, to seeing the adults they'll become and the, the amazing human beings that they will grow into. And every person is like that. Every single person. four things we need in life. You know, we need to eat so that our body has energy. We need to drink because we're 75% water. And we need shelter from the elements. The one that most people overlook is the need for love and companionship. Attitude was made with funding from New Zealand On Air.